In this module, you're going to be learning about child development theories. There are lots of different theorists out there, but we're going to pull from the, the traditional ones. And the first one I want to talk about is Arnold Gisnell in his theory. It's called maturational theory. He has three main assumptions, and the first one being the biggest, and he believes that development has a biological base. He thinks that development has to do with genetics. He also went on to say that, um, that the child will have uh, alternate between a good year and a bad year, back and forth. And then he went on to say that it has, um, their development has something to do with their body type, and there are three main body types. One's called the endomorph, um, which is tall and thin, the ectomorph, which is kind of um, uh, more like an athlete's body, and mesomorph would be more round. Um, and he said that it correlated with personality development. Um, he believed that child development happened in stages and it was called Gazelle's developmental schedules. And children who show development early are more likely to have higher intelligence, was his thought. Now, we know from research um, and from experience that this isn't ex exactly true. It could happen in some cases, but for the most part we know that, that children develop at different rates and we know that um, intelligence can be measured not only in the traditional way of math, logic, and words, but also in um, lots of different ways like kinesthetic or interpersonal or interpersonal, all the things that are associated with Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences. And so there's just simply not enough proof to say that children who uh, show early development are more likely to have higher intelligence. Um, the scale is still used today, but it's used to show infant development to see if maybe there's a problem. They look at what is traditionally normal infant development, and they can look at things like, does a child have lead poisoning that's affected their brain development, or does a child have um, abnormal brain function? So doctors still use that today. Um, the first one that I said, development has a biological base, is pre predominantly what he believes. He believes that genetics affects everything. And I believe mostly biological and genetics affect the development, but not so much the environment. And again, I think we know that the environment does affect a child, um, but we also know that genetics do as well. He said, quote, a stable environment is important to a child, but only so that they can develop naturally according to their genetics. And so when you look at Gesnell's, uh, Gesell's maturational theory, it's heavily um, laden with biology and genetics. And think about that. Do you think that biology or genetics has anything to do with the development of a child? Um, certainly would if the child has some sort of abnormal chromosome, like uh, Down syndrome. Um, if a child isn't properly nourished, or if a child's had lead poisoning, that, that's an environmental thing. But um, if a child um, has, the mother's been sick for some reason, the child didn't develop correctly, the child's born prematurely, all of those things can affect a child's development. Again, they're not necessarily genetics, but they are biology. So he believed that biology and genetics had a lot to do with um, how a child develops in their different stages. All right, so the next one we're talking about is Erickson. And Erickson had a theory called psychosocial theory and had several stages to it. He believed that personality happened in stages and he describes these social stages across the span of a lifetime, starting at birth and going to death. And so he believed that the main element is what's called ego identity. You think about ego when you hear someone say they have a big ego, it means they think a lot of themselves. Identity is what do you feel about yourself. Ego identity is the conscious sense of self that we develop through social interaction. We begin to learn who we are and what we like about ourselves and what we don't like about ourselves. According to Erickson, our identity is constantly changing due to new experiences and information that we, that we acquire in our daily interaction with others. So at each stage, a person experiences conflict. When you experience conflict, that motivates you to change. So it makes sense that when he says that a person experiences conflict and their stage will change, if you become uncomfortable with something, you usually try to change it. So we begin with the first stage. The first stage is trust versus mistrust. And this is the infant stage up to one year. Think about babies. Babies are completely dependent. 
And so they have to trust. They have to be born knowing to depend and knowing to trust. And an infant is utterly dependent so that trust is based on the dependability and the quality of the child's caregiver. So if the child develops trust, he must feel safe and secure. Caregivers who are inconsistent, emotionally unavailable, or rejecting contribute to a feeling of mistrust, the opposite feeling of what, what we want for good development. Failure to develop trust can result in fear and belief that the world is inconsistent and unpredictable. And the opposite is true if, if a child has good caregiving and where they feel trust that they're going to feel, feel comfortable enough to move on to the next stage. The next stage is called autonomy versus shame. We all know that autonomy means being able to do something on your own and feeling like you can go and do something on your own. And shame is um, feeling embarrassed that you can't do something. So this takes place, this autonomy versus shame stage takes place during early childhood and is focused on children developing a greater sense of personal control. So toilet training is one of those things that the child takes control of. If you've ever toilet trained a toddler, you know that uh, you can sit them on the potty as many times as you want to, but they're not going to go until they're good and ready. And so uh, if that's something that they control. That's their autonomy. Toilet training is a vital part of this process. Gaining control over uh, bodily functions um, leads to a feeling of control and self-dependence. So other events for a child in this age group of gaining autonomy would be choosing their foods and choosing their toys and maybe even choosing their clothing. So children who successfully complete this stage, they feel secure and confident, while those who do not are left with a sense of inadequacy and a sense of self-doubt. Erickson believed that achieving a balance between autonomy and shame and doubt would lead to what is called will, which is the belief that children can act with intentions within reason and limits. We've all heard about a strong-willed child, a child that wants their way. Um, the, the, the best part about this is when children have a will and a desire, if it's going in the right direction, then that motivates them to have the autonomy to be able to do things on their own and a desire to do that. The next stage is initiative versus guilt, and this stage covers the school years from about five years old to 11 years old. And this happens through social interactions. Children begin to develop a sense of pride in their accomplishments and their abilities. Children are encouraged and praised by their parents and teachers. Those children develop a sense of, of competence and a belief in their skills. Those who receive little or no encouragement from parents and teachers and peers will doubt their abilities to be successful. So as a teacher of early childhood, early childhood goes up through eight years old, you can see where it's important to praise children genuinely, not just good job, good job, good job, but um, look at their work and look at their behavior and, and notice it for them and encourage them. Successfully finding balance in this stage will lead to a strength known as competence or a belief of our own abilities to handle the task before us. The next stage is called identity versus confusion and this is the adolescent years. These are the ones that nobody really knows what to do with. Those who receive proper encouragement and reinforcement through personal exploration will emerge from this stage with a strong sense of self, uh, strong sense of self and a feeling of independence and control doesn't mean they'll have it while they're in it, but they'll emerge from it with that. Those who remain unsure of their beliefs and desires will feel insecure and confused about themselves in the future. Completing this stage successfully leads to what Erickson calls fidelity. And fidelity um, is the ability to live by society's standards and expectations. The next stage is called intimacy versus isolation. This is early adulthood. And people develop um, those close, committed relationships during that time. Those who are successful at this step will form relationships that are committed and secure. Remember, each step builds on the previous step. So a strong sense of personal identity was important for developing intimate relationships. Studies have de demonstrated that those with a poor sense of self tend to have less committed relationships and are more likely to suffer emotional isolation, loneliness, and depression. Successful resolution of this stage results in the virtue of love. It's marked by the ability to form lasting, meaningful relationships with other people. 
The next stage is called generativity versus stagnation. During adulthood, we continue to build on our lives and we focus on our careers and we focus on our families. Those who are successful during this phase will feel that they want to contribute to the world and that they are contributing to the world and being active in their home and in their community. And those who fail at this skill will feel unproductive and uninvolved in the world. And the virtue that comes out of this is care. Care is a virtue when this stage is handled successfully is what is achieved, being proud of what your accomplishments are. And the last one is called integrity versus despair and it happens in old age. And a person feels like their life has been accomplished and their life is well spent. And they can look back on their life and say, I've spent my life and I've done what I wanted to do and I've helped people and I feel good about my life. Then they have a sense of integrity. And those who don't feel this, they feel like their, wife, their life has been wasted and that they have many regrets. So those are Eric's stages of development and he believes that each um, child goes through these and each person goes through these throughout their life. Then we move on to Piaget. Piaget is the guy who's responsible for what's called cognitive and developmental theory. Cognitive means thinking, and then of course developmental is development. His theories describe the cognitive development of children, the thinking of children. In Piaget's view, early cognitive development involves processes based upon actions and later progresses into changes into mental operations. So they act and then they think about it. He has four stages. The first one is called the sensory motor stage. And during this stage, infants and toddlers acquire knowledge through the things that they sense, through their sensory experiences. Think of what toddlers do. They put things in their mouth, they pick up things, they throw things, they feel things, they grab things, they, they taste things. Um, so, so manipulating these objects and using their senses is how they develop. One of the most important things that happens at this stage is called object permanence. Have you ever played peekaboo with a baby and you put your hands up in front of their face, in front of your face, and the baby thinks you're gone? When you take your hands away, you reappear. That that child has not established object permanence. He, uh, the child, needs to uh, eventually will grow and and dis and discover that if he moves your hands, then you're behind the hands. Um, but for a very small child object permanence uh, doesn't happen. The next stage is called the pre-operational stage and at this stage kids learn through pretend play but they still struggle with logic and and taking the point of view of other people. It's my world to a toddler. Um, language development is one of the big hallmarks of this period. Language development happens uh, predominantly between ages two and five and children at this stage are very egocentric it's um, everything is from their point of view and their understanding of conserv conservation is skewed. Conservation is, uh, for example, when you put out a, a glass, two, two different glasses, one might be a tumbler that's short and wide and the other one might be tall and thin, and you put one cup of liquid in each one. The tall and thin one looks like it has more liquid because it's taller and, and it, therefore it's higher up. Um, and the child, when you ask the child, which one has more liquid in it, they're going to point to the tall one because they don't understand the idea of conservation. Conservation is the idea that if I put one cup into this and I pour that same cup um, into another vessel, it's going to be the same amount. They don't understand that. They just go by what it looks like. So if you put four quarters on the table and space them an inch apart, and then you took another four quarters and put them on the table and space them two inches apart, they would say the ones that was space, space two inches apart would be have more money uh, just because it formed a longer line. The next stage is called the concrete operational stage and children at this point uh, a development begin to think more logically but their thinking sometimes can be kind of rigid so they tend to struggle with abstract and hypothetical concepts. Children in this stage can begin to form specific experiences to, that go to a principle. For example, a child might have a collie for a pet. The child knows that the collie is a dog and that that dog is an animal. This process is called reversibility. So they can know that an animal is a dog is a collie and the collie is a dog is an animal. And so they can be able to associate that, that uh, reasoning. 
The last one is called formal operational stage, and this final stage of Piaget's theory involves an increase in logic, the ability to use deductive reasoning, and an understanding of abstract thoughts. So Piaget believed that deductive logic becomes important during the formal operational stage. That's this stage. Deductive logic requires the ability to use a general principle to determine a specific outcome. This type of thinking involves hypothetical situations and is often required in science and math. So in an in a algebra problem, it requires, the, uh, it requires deductive thinking. It requires you to think, well, if I add this and this and this together, then this is what will come out. That abstract thinking is developmental. It doesn't just happen in young children. It doesn't happen with more training or more math. It happens as a child is able to think and reason. And that comes with time. In this stage, um, during the formal operational stage, the ability to systematically solve a problem in a logical and method methodological way emerges. And children in the formal operational stage of cognitive development are often able to quickly plan and organize approach to solving a problem. So if there is an issue on the playground, they might figure out how to divide something up so that someone has turns or that three people can play in the same space. That's formal operational stage, being able to problem solve. The next one we're going to is Maslow. And Maslow is um, known for what's called the hierarchy of need. And he asked himself, what motivates behavior? When you think about um, the hierarchy of need, what do we need? What are our very basic needs? And our very basic needs Number one are physiological needs. We need air, we need water, we need food, and we need sleep. Think about if a child is sleep deprived or hungry. A child can't learn. And so that basic need has to be met before we can move on to the next need. The next need is security. A child needs to feel safe and uh, needs to feel that they're secure for their survival. Think about it again. If a child doesn't feel safe, if a child is hungry, if a child um, doesn't have enough sleep, they can't learn. You have to make sure that their basic needs are taken care of. They have food, they have water, they have sleep, they have uh, security, and they're safe. The next one is their social needs. And a child needs to feel that they belong and that they have love and affection. Again, if a child doesn't have love and affection or a child doesn't feel belonging, they're going to feel threatened or outcasts, and that's going to be foremost in their mind before they think about learning. That's going to occupy their brain. If something is occupying your brain, think about when you have a problem. That's all you can think about, and it's hard to think about anything else. The same is with the child. If their social needs are not being met, then, then the learning stops. The next is um, their esteem. The, this is the need for things that uh, reflect on self-esteem, personal self-worth social recognition and accomplishment. They need to feel that they're doing something right, that they're progressing, that they um, are, are successful. Just like us, we need to feel that we're successful in order to feel like we're doing a good job. And the last is called self-actualizing needs. That's personal growth. Um, less concerned with the opinion of others and want to reach the fullest potential. That's more, probably you see that more in an adult. But you might see that in some young people, that they know what they want. They want to grow personally. They want to contribute. They don't care what other people think so much. Um, they care that what they're doing is right. And um, all of those have to take place in order for learning to, to really happen. So physiological needs, security needs, social needs, esteem needs, and then self-actualizing needs.